Travis Rudolph's murder case. For over a decade, young Travis Rudolph had been focused on building his career as a football player. He was strong, fast, and incredibly talented, and nothing mattered more to him. But one day, his world came crashing down, and his career may never be the same. Everything was going well, not a single thing out of place. But he made the worst mistake of his life when he invited the woman whom he claimed to love. The aftermath was one nobody saw coming, but would later land him in jail and eventually sitting in court as his career passed by. The Story Travis Rudolph was a promising young man and had just secured an amazing contract with a Canadian football team. In preparation for the upcoming season, he had committed himself to training at the Miami Sports Performance Facility and bettering himself. He needed to be in top form for the season so he could dominate and do what he did best. You know, I hate losing, so... After a while, Travis decided to come back home to his Lake Park residence in Palm Beach County, Florida. He had not seen his family in a really long time and he missed them. So reuniting with his brother and mother was the highlight of his entire month. But there was one person that Travis couldn't deny that he missed as well, his girlfriend, Dominique Jones. So Travis did as any other man would do. He invited her over to his residence. A few moments after, the couples were reunited and it was all smiles and hugs. Dominique missed her boyfriend, and she had looked forward to getting to spend some time with him again, especially since he had been away and was always so busy and focused on his training. The couple sat down to talk, catch up, and then eventually even decided to play a game of Uno, where the loser of each round takes a shot. It was a blissful evening, but fate would not have it so for very long. It all started when Dominique got a hold of Travis's phone and saw something in there that would send shockwaves down her spine. It was a chat with another beautiful young lady and there was nothing platonic about it. As she held the phone in her hand, her eyes widened at the realization Travis was cheating on her with another woman. How could she have missed this? Anger welled up inside her and so she confronted her boyfriend about it. But before Travis could explain, she began to yell and get even more visibly upset. As a matter of fact, she even got physical with Travis and it ended up in a scuffle that resulted in Dominique falling to the ground twice. The altercation was getting too heated. Travis's brother, Daryl had to get involved to de-escalate the situation and tell Dominique to go home. Dominique, however, had built up so much rage, but she knew there was nothing she could do right now. She was outnumbered and overpowered, so she told Travis to watch his back and that she would bring her brother to deal with him. Now, Travis didn't take her seriously. After all, there was no way she could be serious, right? She couldn't possibly bring that kind of trouble to his doorstep, especially with his mother being here too. She was just upset, understandably so. She'll eventually calm down, he thought. Well, he thought wrong. At about midnight on April 7th, the course of Travis's life changed forever when four uninvited young men showed up at his doorstep. One of them was Dominique's brother, Kaishan Jones. By now, Travis knew that this was going to get ugly, but there was no way he could back out now. The young men rang the doorbell, and Daryl was the first to get to the door and open it up. Travis joined his brother momentarily. It was four against two, and another heated argument ensued. The Rudolph brothers were clearly outnumbered this time, and Travis was well aware of that fact, so he ran back into the house and came out with an automatic gun. As soon as the uninvited guests saw the weapon, 
they took to their heels and retreated into the car they had come with. However, Rudolph was not letting it go that easily. He opened fire on the men as they drove away and kept shooting until the vehicle eventually crashed near a gas station nearby. At this point, there was only one thing left to do. Call 911. Apparently, that night had turned out worse than any of them had anticipated. One of the four guys that had visited the Rudolph house that night, only three had made it back into the car. The fourth person was nowhere to be found as at the time the bullet-riddled Cadillac crashed by the gas station. But it got worse. The driver, a man named Sebastian Jean Jacques, was unresponsive and was later pronounced dead on the spot. It was also eventually discovered that he had been shot ten times. The fourth guy, Tyler Robinson, who appeared to be lost, was finally found near the Rudolph residence, severely injured from gunshot wounds, and so had to be rushed to St. Mary's Medical Center in critical condition. It was a terrible occurrence, and the authorities were all over the case. However, another interesting piece of information that lent a voice to the case was a pistol that was found on the floor near the Rudolph residence. It was believed to be owned by none other than Kaishan Jones himself. So after, the authorities swung into action to investigate the matter. First, they went to one of Travis's neighbors to get their account of the situation that happened that night. The cooperative neighbor mentioned that earlier in the day, he had overheard Travis fighting with his girlfriend, Dominique. He watched her leave the house in anger and rage. Then, around midnight, a group of guys walked towards Travis's home. There was an altercation, a scuffle between them. And the next thing he knew, shots were fired multiple times, after which he saw Travis walk back into his house with a gun. The police conducted other investigations, and all the stories were corroborated the next line of action was clear. A few days after, Travis Rudolph was arrested and charged with one count of first-degree murder with a firearm and three counts of attempted first-degree murder with a firearm. He was taken into custody at around 4 a.m. at Palm Beach County Jail and was held without bond. All hope seemed to be lost for Travis. His contracts and sponsors pulled out on the same day, and it seemed like it was the beginning of the end for the athlete. On the other hand, according to Travis's mother, her son acted in self-defense as Keyshawn brought a gun and had threatened to kill him in his own house. All of this raises so many questions. Was Travis justified in his actions? Did he truly act in self-defense? But most importantly, what type of person was Travis Rudolph in the first place? Well, all of these questions are valid, and eventually the case did make it to court and was thrashed out in the face of the law. And we will get to that, but to understand the kind of person Travis is, we first need to hear from some of the people around him. Here is what one of Travis's neighbors thinks of him and the whole fiasco. A lot of his neighbors also had amazing things to say about the young athlete, and they all believed something was terribly wrong with the case. Travis had to be acting in self-defense to protect his mother and brother. He was not capable of killing someone unprovoked. He was a good man. More interestingly, all of these testimonies of his neighbors represented only a fraction of the many great things said about this young man. So what is it about this young man that has gathered so many testimonies on his behalf? Well, to understand that, we need to dig a little deeper into Travis Rudolph's background. The Background Back in high school, Travis was no ordinary high school student. He was a high achiever, especially on the football field. 
He attended Cardinal Newman High School in West Palm Beach, and he was a standard athlete making friends, parents, and school proud in the field of play. No doubt, the young man showed a lot of promise, and as a result, he made the national All-American team as a wide receiver. A feat that he worked really hard for and pushed himself to the limit. At this point, Travis was beside himself with joy. His future was as bright as the sun, and he was only in high school. By the time he was ready to go to college, multiple colleges would want him in their schools. And just as predicted, his expectations were unsurpassed because as soon as he was ready for college, he got a scholarship from 32 colleges, all basically begging that he brings his amazing talent into their school. The question on everyone's mind became, where would he go? Which scholarship would he accept? Soon enough, on January 2nd, 2017, Everyone's curiosity was satisfied when he announced his next move on national television. He played for Florida State University, and he worked hard and brought his A-game when he played. By the time he was a sophomore, he was already the first choice as a wide receiver, breaking records and scoring multiple touchdowns, making his team proud. So far, the sky was the only starting point for him. But here is where Travis Rudolph's background story gets even more interesting. On December 14, 2016, Travis and some of his classmates visited Mortford Middle School in Tennessee just to speak to the students, encourage them, and drive for positive social change. But during lunchtime at the school, something incredible happened. Everyone was seated at the lunchroom, eating and talking in groups. But out of the corner of his eye, he spotted a young boy sitting in the corner on his table. But he was alone. Without thinking, he walked toward the young boy and asked, Yo, can I have a seat? Seat with you and eat with you? He was like, sure, why not? You know, we just started off having, having a good conversation. Little did Travis know that this little boy was living with autism. And as a result, he often had challenges dealing with other students. So naturally, no one liked to sit with him during lunch, and being alone and ignored was a normal thing to him. But that little gesture by Travis had completely changed his life. He was happier than he had ever been. He also became popular in school, and from then on, his table was always filled with other students eating and talking with him. Travis's gesture that day had an overarching effect on the young boy's life. And as a photo of the pair eating at lunchtime went viral, it sent hope to all mothers who had children living with autism that there is hope for their kids and they too can live a normal life. This went further to strengthen Travis's character the more, and he even went on to sign a new contract with the New Giants as a free agent in 2017, and then with Miami Dolphins just the following year. Life was good, his character was great, his reputation was clean and impeccable. But just on the same day he signed with the Dolphins, something terrible happened. He suffered a severe knee injury that could threaten his career. He was devastated. Everyone believed that this was the end for Travis Rudolph. But to those around him, Travis was not going to let this be the end of him. He underwent surgery and nursed his knee back to health. And before long, he made a very amazing comeback. There was no stopping him by every ramification. Travis was a fascinating human being who was good and down to earth. This also helped him secure yet another contract with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, a Canadian football team in 2020. He was supposed to resume there in a few weeks and start the next season with them, but sadly, he was arrested and held by the authorities. As a result, his contract was withdrawn terminated. 
Now that we're all caught up, his past and present up until he was taken to court, let's delve into just how deep this case went in court. The Legal Proceedings Murder begins where self-defense ends. Twice, the prosecuting counsel, Richard Clausen, made this quote in his opening statement and it shed some light on the foundations by which his case was built. As you might imagine, there were a lot of questions regarding the case. For one, the defense counsel contends that all Travis did was simply protect himself from those who wanted to harm him and his brother. It was also contended that Dominique's brother brought a gun with the intention of killing Travis and so it was legitimate for Travis to defend himself by shooting at them. As a matter of fact, after careful probing, some facts of the case showed that at a point during the scuffle, Dominique's brother had pulled out his gun and aimed it at Travis. Then he said, It's demon time. It was at that point that Travis had dashed into his house and back out again with his own gun. This makes the self-defense argument plausible, right? There was also the fact that when Dominique had told her brother to go deal with Travis, he responded with, He's a dead man walking. On top of that, Dominique had replied with, Go shoot his shit up. More facts to support the self-defense claim, you might think. But the prosecution begged to differ. They believed that Travis used more force than was necessary to stop the attack. Specifically, the prosecution contended that Travis opened fire when his attackers were already running from the house. To make it worse, investigators discovered that Travis had fired his gun a total of 39 times, 10 of which killed the driver of the Cadillac they came with. On that note, they argue that this was not self-defense, but a clear case of murder. After the opening statements, both counsels began their questioning of witnesses and one of the most interesting ones was when Dominique Jones herself was called in for questioning. The plan of attack for the defense was to discredit her as a witness and get her shaky and fidgety, and the questioning continued and the plan seemed to be working. One of the bones of contention was that she had sent her brother to go kill Travis when she said, Go shoot his shit up. The defense counsel opined that it meant Dominique wanted her brother to shoot Travis. However, she disagreed and just waved it off as an expression of some sort. Whether Dominique did justice to that argument, you decide. But the defense did not relent on Dominique. The counsel seemed to love making her uncomfortable and asking leading questions intended to rattle her or make her look nervous. In fact, at one point, they almost got into an argument before the presiding judge stepped Sustain. in to put them Sustain. back on track. Another interesting revelation in the case was the fact that Travis denied that he and Dominique were even in an exclusive relationship. During his testimony, Travis Rudolph, who was now 27 years old, disputed the notion that Dominique Jones, the woman involved in the confrontation that led to a brawl in front of his home, was his official girlfriend. Rudolph described their relationship as a bit complex, saying that he had a lot of love for her, but considered himself a single man. They frequently exchanged texts and calls, but leading up to the incident, Rudolph's primary focus was on rehabilitating a knee injury. He explained, I was actually taking my time to evaluate his relationship with Jones and his future plans. While they hadn't discussed marriage, they had talked about having children. His ambition was clear. He aimed to join a Canadian Football League team with the ultimate goal of returning to the National Football League where he had previously played for the New York Giants before injuring his knee during a workout with the Miami Dolphins. However, during cross-examination, prosecutor Francine Edwards vigorously challenged Rudolph's claims. She pointed out that Jones spent a significant amount of time at Rudolph's Lake Park home 
and they frequently exchanged I love yous. She repeatedly suggested that Rudolph had cheated on Jones, a claim that he vehemently denied. Edwards even posed a rhetorical question, wondering aloud whether this meant he could screw anyone, causing gasps from the gallery. After several weeks of back and forth, it was finally time for the final judgment. Travis Rudolph breathed a sigh of relief as he heard the verdict delivered by a Palm Beach County jury. In a courtroom filled with tension and anticipation, he was found not guilty of a most grave charge, one count of first-degree murder. The weight of the accusation had loomed over him, threatening to alter the course of his life in an irrevocable way. But the jury's decision didn't stop there. In a moment that felt like the culmination of an emotional roller coaster, they also acquitted Rudolph of three counts of attempted murder. These charges had hinted at a confrontation that had spiraled dangerously out of control, endangering multiple lives. Yet, the jury's deliberation went further. They meticulously considered each aspect of the case, ultimately deciding not to convict Rudolph of lesser offenses either, such as second-degree murder or manslaughter. This comprehensive exoneration marked a turning point in Travis Rudolph's life, allowing him to breathe freely after enduring a legal battle that held his future in the balance.